Chapter One of Death in Venice by Thomas Mann, translated by Kenneth Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lee Smalley. Chapter One. On a spring afternoon of the year nineteen blank. When our continent lay under such threatening weather for whole months, Gustav Aschenbach, or von Aschenbach, as his name read officially after his fiftieth birthday, had left his apartment on the Prinz Regentenstrasse in Munich and had gone for a long walk, overwrought by the trying and precarious work of the forenoon, which had demanded a maximum wariness, prudence, penetration, and rigor of the will the writer had not been able even after the noon meal to break the impetus of the productive mechanism within him that modus animi continuus which constitutes according to cicero the foundation of eloquence and he had not attained the healing sleep which what with the increasing exhaustion of his strength he needed in the middle of each day so he had gone outdoors soon after tea in the hopes that air and movement would restore him and prepare him for a profitable evening. It was the beginning of May, and after cold, damp weeks a false midsummer had set in. The English gardens, although the foliage was still fresh and sparse, were as pungent as in August, and in the parts nearer the city had been full of conveyances and promenaders. At the Almeister, which he had reached by quieter and quieter paths, Aschenbach had surveyed for a short time the Wirstgarten with its lively crowds and its border of cabs and carriages. From here, as the sun was sinking, he had started home, outside the park, across the open fields. And since he felt tired, and a storm was threatening from the direction of Fering, he waited at the North Cemetery for the tram which would take him directly back to the city. It happened that he found no one in the station or its vicinity. There was not a vehicle to be seen, either on the paved Ungerstrasse, with its solitary glistening rails stretching out towards Schwabing, or on the Feringer Chaussee. Behind the fences of the stonemason's establishments, where the crosses, memorial tablets, and monuments standing for sale formed a second, uninhabited burial ground, there was no sign of life, and opposite him the Byzantine structure of the funeral hall lay silent in the reflection of the departing day. Its façade, ornamented in luminous colours with Greek crosses and hieratic paintings, above which were displayed inscriptions symmetrically arranged in gold letters, and texts chosen to bear on the life beyond, such as, They enter into the dwelling of the Lord, or, The light of eternity shall shine upon them. And for some time, as he stood waiting, he found a grave diversion in spelling out the formulas and letting his mind's eye lose itself in the transparent mysticism, when, returning from his reveries, he noticed in the portico, above the two apocalyptic animals guarding the steps, a man whose somewhat unusual appearance gave his thoughts an entirely new direction. Whether he had just now come out from the inside, through the bronze door, or had approached and mounted from the outside unobserved, remained uncertain. Aschenbach, without applying himself especially to the matter, was inclined to believe the former. Of medium height, thin, smooth-shaven, and noticeably pug-nosed, the man belonged to the red-haired type, and possessed the appropriate fresh milky complexion. Obviously he was not of Bavarian extraction, since at least the white and straight-brimmed straw hat that covered his head gave his appearance the stamp of a foreigner, of someone who had come from a long distance. To be sure, he was wearing the customary knapsack strapped across his shoulders, and a belted suit of rough yellow wool. His left arm was resting on his thigh, and his grey storm cape was thrown across it. In his right hand he held a cane with an iron ferrule, which he had struck diagonally into the ground, and, with his feet crossed, was leaning his hip against the crook. 
His head was raised, so that the Adam's apple protruded hard and bare on a scrawny neck emerging from a loose sport shirt, and he was staring sharply off into the distance with colourless, red-lidded eyes, between which stood two strong, vertical wrinkles, peculiarly suited to his short, turned-up nose. Thus, and perhaps his elevated position, helped to give the impression his bearing had something majestic and commanding about it, something bold, or even savage, for whether he was grimacing because he was blinded by the setting sun, or whether it was a case of a permanent distortion of the physiognomy, his lips seemed too short, they were so completely pulled back from his teeth, that these were exposed even to the gums, and stood out white and long. It is quite possible that Aschenbach, in his half-distracted, half-inquisitive examination of the stranger, had been somewhat inconsiderate, for he suddenly became aware that his look was being answered, and indeed so militantly, so straight in the eye, so plainly with the intention of driving the thing through to the very end, and compelling him to capitulate, that he turned away uncomfortably, and began walking along by the fences, deciding casually that he would pay no further attention to the man. The next minute he had forgotten him but perhaps the exotic element in the stranger's appearance had worked on his imagination, or a new physical or spiritual influence of some sort had come into play. He was quite astonished to note a peculiar inner expansion, a kind of roving unrest, a youthful longing after far-off places, a feeling so vivid, so new or so long dormant and neglected, that, with his hands behind his back, and his eyes on the ground, he came to a sudden stop, and examined into the nature and purport of this emotion. It was the desire for travel, nothing more, although, to be sure, it had attacked him violently, and was heightened to a passion, even to the point of an hallucination. His yearnings crystallized, his imagination, still in ferment from his hours of work, actually pictured all the marvels and terrors of a manifold world which it was suddenly struggling to conceive. He saw a landscape, a tropical swampland, under a heavy, murky sky, damp, luxuriant, and enormous, a kind of prehistoric wilderness of islands, bogs, and arms of water, sluggish with mud. He saw, near him and in the distance, the hairy shafts of palms rising out of a rank lecherous thicket, out of places where the plant life was fat, swollen, and blossoming exorbitantly. He saw strangely misshapen trees sending their roots into the ground, into stagnant pools with greenish reflections, and here, between floating flowers which were milk-white and large as dishes, birds of a strange nature, high-shouldered, with crooked bills, were standing in the muck, and looking motionlessly to one side. Between dense knotted stalks of bamboo, he saw the glint from the eyes of a crouching tiger, and he felt his heart knocking with fear and with puzzling desires. Then the image disappeared, and with a shake of his head, Aschenbach resumed his walk along past the fences of the stonemason's establishments. Since the time, at least, when he could command the means to enjoy the advantages of moving about the world as he pleased, he had considered travelling simply as an hygienic precaution which must be complied with now and then, despite one's feeling and one's preferences. Too busy with the tasks arranged for him by his interest in his own ego and in the problems of Europe, too burdened with the onus of production, too little prone to diversion, and in no sense an amateur of the varied amusements of the great world, he had been thoroughly satisfied with such knowledge of the earth's surface as any one can get without moving far out of his own circle, and he had never even been tempted to leave Europe, especially now that his life was slowly on the decline, and that the artist's fear of not having finished, this uneasiness lest the clock run down before he had done his part, and given himself completely, could no longer be waved aside as mere whim, he had confined his outer existence, almost exclusively, to the beautiful city which had become his home, and to the rough country house which he had built in the mountains, and where he spent the rainy summers. 
Further, this thing which had laid hold of him so belatedly, but with such suddenness, was very readily moderated and adjusted by the force of his reason and of a discipline which he had practised since youth. He had intended carrying his life-work forward, to a certain point, before removing to the country, and the thought of knocking about the world for months, and neglecting his work during this time, seemed much too lax and contrary to his plans. It really could not be considered seriously. Yet he knew only too well what the reasons were for this unexpected temptation. It was the urge to escape, he admitted to himself, this yearning for the new and the remote, this appetite for freedom, for unburdening, for forgetfulness. It was a pressure away from his work, from the steady drudgery of a coldly passionate service. To be sure, he loved this work, and almost loved the enervating battle that was fought daily between a proud, tenacious will, so often tested, and this growing weariness which no one was to suspect, and which must not betray itself in his productions by any sign of weakness or negligence. But it seemed wise not to draw the bow over tightly, and not to strangle by sheer obstinacy so strongly persistent an appetite. He thought of his work, thought of the place at which yesterday, and now again today, he had been forced to leave off, and which, it seemed, would yield neither to patience and coaxing, nor to a definite attack. He examined it again, trying to break through, or to circumvent the deadlock, but he gave up with a shudder of repugnance. There was no unusual difficulty here. What balked him were the scruples of aversion, which took the form of a fastidious insatiability. Even as a young man, this insatiability had meant to him the very nature, the fullest essence, of talent, and for that reason he had restrained and chilled his emotions, since he was aware that they inclined to content themselves with a happy approximation, a state of semi-completion. Were these enslaved emotions now taking their vengeance on him? By leaving him in the lurch, by refusing to forward and lubricate his art? And were they bearing off with them every enjoyment, every live interest in form and expression? Not that he was producing anything bad. His years gave him at least this advantage, that he felt himself at all times in full and easy possession of his craftsmanship. But while the nation honoured him for this, he himself was not content and it seemed to him that his work lacked the marks of that fiery and fluctuating emotionalism which is an enormous thing in one's favour, and which, while it argues an enjoyment on the part of the author, also constitutes, more than any depth of content, the enjoyment of the amateur. He feared the summer in the country, alone in the little house, with the maid who prepared his meals, and the servant who brought them to him. He feared the familiar view of the mountain peaks, and the slopes which would stand about him in his boredom and his discontent. Consequently, there was need of a break in some new direction. If the summer was to be endurable and productive, he must attempt something out of his usual orbit. He must relax, get a change of air, bring an element of freshness into the blood. To travel, then, that much was settled. Not far, not all the way to the Tigers, but one night on the sleeper, and a rest of three or four weeks at some pleasant resort in the south. He thought this out while the noise of the electric tram came nearer along the Ungerstrasse, and as he boarded it, he decided to devote the evening to the study of maps and timetables. On the platform it occurred to him to look around for the man in the straw hat, his companion during that most significant time spent waiting at the station. But his whereabouts remained uncertain, as he was not to be seen either at the place where he was formerly standing, or anywhere else in the vicinity of the station, or on the car itself. End of chapter 1